about to gavel in. They're going to spend the first hour on general speeches before considering two judicial nominations at about 11 Eastern. And these are nominations for Alaska and for Alaska and California. And now to live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. Give your light to our senators. Illuminate their paths with your wisdom that they may embrace your precepts and seek your truth. May the light of your truth guide them as they seek to solve the complex problems of our time. Lord, help them to see the things they ought to do and give them the courage to act. Show them where to go, how they should decide, and which pitfalls they should avoid. Guided by your light, lead them to your desired destination as they find joy in both serving and loving you. We pray in your strong name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., November 15, 2011. To the Senate. On the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Jean Shaheen, a senator from the state of New Hampshire, to perform the duties of the chair. Son Daniel K. Noe, present for temporary. Later. We're going to, the Republican leader and I will make a few remarks today. Uh, after that, the, the majority will control the first half, Republicans the final half um, of one hour. Following morning business, the Senate will be in executive session to consider the Gleason Rogers nominations. At this stage, we have two scheduled votes. We're going to work with uh, the managers of the bill. Um, Senators Leahy and Grassley and see if we need that second vote. And we'll, that decision will be made later this morning. 
At about 12, there will be, as I indicated, up to two roll call votes on confirmation of these nominations. Following that vote, the Senate will recess until 2.15 p.m. to allow for the week weekly caucus meetings. At 2.15, we'll resume consideration of the Energy and Water Appropriations Bill. As I indicated yesterday, Madam President, we have a lot to do. Thanksgiving is uh, a week after, day after tomorrow. And we have lots of things we just have to complete. We're going to, I gave my word uh, that we're going to do the defense authorization bill. I'm going to, there's some, um, still, it hasn't been worked out to satisfaction of everyone, but there comes a time when we have to stop negotiating and move to the legislation. And we're going to do that. Following our finishing the next minibus we have. It would be wonderful if we could complete that quickly. Uh, as, I've in, as I indicated yesterday, I'm not going to fill the legislative tree on this, but I don't know how much time we're going to be able to spend on this as never-ending amendments. What, it might, what I'd like to do is what we've done in the past is have people offer amendments, but we have to have some kind of a, a limit that will be self-imposed that, that we'll have maybe 10 stacked amendments and we'll have to figure out some way to dispose of those before we move to another batch of amendments. Anyway, we'll work our way through that. There are staffs, um, Mr. Myrick and Mr. Choppa have been working to see if they can help us work through these issues that we have. We also have the CR we have to do. We, have, we hope that we'll have the first minibus, the conference, completed on that. And we have, we'll finish that, uh, this work period. So there's lots to do, and we, because when we come back after Thanksgiving, we only have three or four weeks until we're there at Christmas. So I, as, I'm out and as I said yesterday, I think it looks like we are going to be able to finish our work here at a reasonable time this week. I hope we don't have to work this weekend. I hope we don't have to work next week. I don't think we'll have to do that, but everyone should, everyone should be prepared in case we do because we have some things that have to be done, like the CR. When we come back after the Thanksgiving recess, I tell everyone now, uh, we're, the, we're not going to be able to do our normal uh, short weeks here, so people, can, uh, people are going to have to spend less time at home because the workload after Thanksgiving is really, really, we have lots to do. And these are things that, again, we have expiring tax provisions that we have to work on, and if we're fortunate, this Super Committee comes up with something that's 30 hours that they'll have to debate that issue. So we have to be prepared after Thanksgiving to just be here until we're ready to leave for Christmas. Madam President, it's possible to open a newspaper or watch cable news these days without hearing my Republican colleagues talk about the evils of job-killing regulations. That's in quotes. Each day they arrive in the Senate floor to rail against the safeguards that keep our water clean, our air fresh, and our minds safe. According to the GOP, these safeguards are actually the source of all this nation's economic woes. These terrible, horrible, time-consuming government regulations that hinder the economic pro progress of America. Republicans would have you believe that these common sense rules that check the greed of Wall Street banks, keep huge corporations honest, and stop big oil's unnecessary risk-taking are also causing small businesses great harm. Indeed, that would be a terrible thing if it were true, and it isn't. Uh, while it's proper to guard against and remove onerous regulations, and we need to do that, my Republican friends have yet to produce a single shred of evidence that the regulations they hate so much do the broad economic harms they claim. That's because there aren't any. Conversely, there's plenty of evidence to prove those regulations save lives, prevent asthma attacks, and ensure mom and pops face a fair fight against these multinational corporations and moneyed interest groups. And there's plenty of evidence to prove that disasters like BP oil spill and the financial crisis of 2008 could have been prevented by better, stronger government watchdog regulations. But Republicans aren't relying on evidence as they propagate the myth of the job-killing regulation. They're relying on repetition. There are many people, but let's just take one. Bruce Bartlett, an advisor to President Ronald Reagan, a Treasury official under President George H.W. Bush, and he's a trusted conservative voice on economics. 
I had many to choose from, but I chose this one to talk about a little bit today. He offered a number of strong words on the regulation monster under big business bid. And I quote, no hard evidence is offered for this claim. It is simply asserted as self-evident and repeated endlessly throughout the conservative echo chamber. In my opinion, as a conservative economist, regulatory uncertainty is a countered invented by Republicans that allows them to use current economic problems to pursue an agenda supported by the business community year in and year out. In other words, it's a simple case of political opportunism, not a serious effort to deal with high unemployment. Listen to what he said again, because it's worth repeating. No hard evidence is offered for this claim. It's simply asserted as self-evident and repeated endlessly throughout the conservative echo chamber. In my opinion, regulatory uncertainty is an, is an invention by Republicans that allows them to use current economic problems to pursue an agenda supported by the business committee year in and year out. In other words, it's a simple case of political opportunism, not a serious effort to deal with high unemployment. But why use regulations proven to protect health of every mom, uh, dad, man, woman, child in this nation as a scapegoat? What are the origins of this myth? I believe, as Bartlett does, the Republicans are attacking regulation because they don't have a plan to create jobs and turn our economy around. No plan. While Democrats have been pushing time-tested remedies for a flagging economy, such as infrastructure investments or middle-class tax cuts, our Republican colleagues have been peddling a cure-all tonic of deregulation. Bartlett says, I quote, people are increasingly concerned about unemployment, but Republicans have nothing to offer them, end of quote. They've offered up the specter of overreaching government regulation to distract from the fact that they haven't offered a single idea for how to put America back to work. And they use the argument to justify rolling back everything from clear air and water safeguards to Wall Street and health insurance industry reforms. We voted on a number of those last week. What's more, they've spread the tall tale that removing these regulations and letting big business do exactly as it pleases will not only prevent job losses, but actually create new jobs. Bartlett called that logical leap, quote, nonsense. It's just made up, he said. So let's talk. Fact, not fiction. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which asks executives why they downsized, only a tiny, tiny fraction of layoffs have anything to do with tighter regulation. Last year, only three-tenths of one percent of people who lost their jobs were let go principally because of government regulations or government intervention. On the other hand, 25% of them were laid off because no business, lack of business. And in, re in a recent survey by the small business majority, only 13% of small businesses cited regulation as their biggest concern. Half said economic uncertainty was the greatest challenge that they have. That's why Democrats have been offering real solutions to our job crisis and policies that help them help small firms hire, grow, and thrive again. The truth is we have enough to worry about in these tough economic times. We can't allow the myth to distract us from the real crisis of high unemployment facing this great nation. Well. <clears throat> Madam President. The Republican leader. <clears throat> Madam President, over the past few weeks, I've highlighted some of the good work Republicans in the House are doing in identifying jobs legislation that members of both parties can agree on. And I've suggested that the Democratic majority here in the Senate follow the lead of House Republicans, take up bipartisan legislation that's already passed in the House, pass it here in the Senate. The American people want us to do something about jobs. They want us to work together. Here's the formula. Let's apply it. We made some progress last week with the Veterans Bill and the 3% withholding bill, but there's a lot more we could do. The House has now passed more than 20 pieces of jobs legislation, many of which have companion bills that are ready to go here in the Senate. I outlined some of them last week. Why don't we take them up? Let's acknowledge the fact that we live in a two-party system and that if we're going to make progress, we need to do it on a bipartisan basis. 
And that means doing precisely what Republicans in the House have been doing for the past year, finding areas where the two parties can actually agree and passing bills that reflect those areas of agreement. That's how legislation works. It's easy to push partisan legislation and then complain when it doesn't go anywhere that the other party is intransigent. The more difficult job, and the one we were sent here to do, is to work together to find solutions to accomplish more than fodder for campaign ads and bus tours. So this morning, I'd like to call on our Democratic friends again to take up these bipartisan House-passed bills. One of these bills, for example, makes it easier for business to raise the capital they need to expand and to create jobs. Senators Tester and Toomey have companion legislation right here in the Senate. Another one increases the number of shareholders that are allowed to invest in a community bank before that bank is required to shoulder costly new burdens from the SEC. Senators Hutchison and Pryor have companion legislation to this bill here in the Senate. Senators Toomey and Carper have a bill that would expand it by applying it to businesses other than banks. Let's take them both up and let's pass them. Two other bipartisan House passed bills give small businesses a new avenue to raise capital and small investors a new opportunity to invest in them. By allowing small businesses to raise money over the internet and through social media without having to shoulder the same kind of regulatory obstacles, as big businesses. We all know that access to capital is one of the key ingredients to economic growth. Here's a way to make it easier for folks to get the capital that also creates new avenues for the little guy to invest and to start hiring. Senators Thune and Scott Brown have companion bills here in the Senate, and why don't we take them up and pass them? This is the kind of approach we should be taking here in the Senate putting aside these great big partisan bills that Democrats know have bipartisan opposition and focusing on smaller proposals that can actually pass. On their own, these bills won't solve the jobs crisis. Frankly, no piece of legislation can, larger or small. But they'll help, and they make it easier for businesses to start hiring. And they'll show the American people something many of them believe we don't do enough of around here, and that's to work together on their behalf. This is how divided government works, through real cooperation and a search for common ground and solutions. This is what Republicans on the Joint Committee have been trying to do for the past several weeks. It's what House Republicans have been doing all year. So I say let's take these bills up and pass them and send them on down to the President for a signature. The administration supports many of these House passed bills. Democrats in the House strongly support many of them and Republicans support them overwhelmingly. So let's do it. Let's build on the momentum we have from last week after passing the 3% withholding and the Veterans Bill, and let's show the American people we've hit upon a formula for legislative success around here. Madam President, I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business until 11 a.m with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the majority controlling the first half and the Republicans controlling the final half. Madam President. The Senator from Maryland. Good morning, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, um, I wish to address one of the most important issues facing the Super Committee, and that is where does Social Security fit into their plans? Madam President, you know, because you're very close to the people of New Hampshire, you know all over your great state and mine in Maryland, people are getting ready for Thanksgiving. And as they get ready for their plans, they first of all give gratitude for living in the United States of America, the land of the free and the brave. But they're also wondering what kind of country are we living in right now? Because you and I know they're worried about paying their bills. As they get ready for their holiday dinner and the family gathering and all the wonderful traditions that go into this very special holiday, they're saying, where are we? Have we lost our way? Do we so mired in partisanship that we can't seem to find a path forward? 
They think we are the turkeys. They want us to stuff it. They want us to get on and start worrying about the table, worry about their kitchen table, and bring everybody to the table here and begin to solve national problems and to do it in a way that brings the country together. And what they want us to do, while well, maybe at the kitchen table, the children will argue over who gets the wishbone, they want us to have backbone to make the tough decisions that these times call for, but not to be tough on one another. And so, Madam President, as I think about this, I think about Social Security. Now, we say everything should be on the table. Well, I think everything should be on the table that caused our deficit. I think everything should be on the table that caused our debt. Social Security did not cause our deficit. Social Security did not cause our debt. Now, do we need to take a look at Social Security to ensure its safety and solvency for the rest of the century, or certainly well beyond 2050 or 2070? Absolutely. But I say this, that while the super committee is charged with looking at a more frugal government, we must maintain the social contract. The social contract in the United States of America is the contract that the United States government made with its people. And it said, if you go by the rules and you paid your dues, a la the payroll tax, there will be a benefit for you. It will be a defined benefit. It's called Social Security. And it will be undeniable, it would be reliable, and it would be inflation-proof. Now, every president has agreed that there is a social contract. And every president has taken a look at how to provide those. Some we've agreed with, some we've disagreed with. Where we agreed was that great, wonderful way we worked in the 80s when Social Security was facing challenges. And President Reagan reached out to Tip O'Neill, Bob Dole, Bob Bird, Howard Baker, and we made Social Security solvent for 30 or 40 years. We did the same under President Bill Clinton. President George Bush, number two Bush, W, wanted to privatize Social Security. We stopped that. We don't believe in the privatization of Social Security. We didn't want to turn Social Security over to the Wall Street. We, didn't, we thought Wall Street got enough. They didn't have to get Social Security. And we didn't want, if you were old or you were sick, to rely on the bull of political promises or the bear of a market. Social Security affects so many people. There are 50 million Americans who rely on Social Security. Retired workers, their spouses, people with disabilities. For two-thirds of the people on Social Security, which are, their benefit is between fourteen and $15,000 a month, it makes up almost all or half of their income. In my own state, 500,000 retired workers are on Social Security. So protecting the social contract is absolutely in our national interest. So what brings me to the floor today? Two things. Number one, I don't think Social Security should be in the debate about how to reduce our debt or our deficit. I do think Social Security should be discussed in a rational, calm, nonpartisan way to ensure safety and solvency and reliability. The other thing that brings me to the floor is how do we put our arms around the cost of living problem? It is indeed vexing. It is vexing. How do we meet the needs of the people but not exacerbate the drawdown in the trust fund? Valid conversations. Wise people should talk about it. But one thing that I am opposed to is something called the chained CPI. Isn't that a terrible word? Chained CPI? In our country, the very word of chains has such a negative, 
negative connotation. And what I worry about is that its draconian effect will have a chain reaction on seniors that will cause a tremendous crash. I'm concerned that we're about to shred the social contract. Now, let me tell you what the chain CPI is. It would actually cut Social Security by over $100 billion over the next 10 years. It does it by changing the cost of living as calculated. In th it's based on a theory. It's based on social engineering, some kind of abstract concepts about human behavior, that invisible hand that Adam Smith talks about. But I worry that this invisible hand will actually pinch Social Security. It assumes consumers will substitute lower-cost items what they normally purchase. It means that if you buy, if apples increase, you'll switch to prices. Uh, to, you'll, if, if the price of apples increases, you'll go buy oranges. Well, I'm afraid that what we're doing is we're going to buy lemons. So the social, the chain CPI is inappropriate because actually seniors have a fixed market basket. They not only have a fixed income, but they have a fixed market basket. Their primary expenditure is health care, health care over which they have little control. And the cost of health care continues to rise. Their next one is energy, food, and then housing. This isn't like changing for the seniors, this isn't like giving up opera tickets for movie tickets. It's not like giving up a latte for Dunkin' Donuts. For them, it's, giving, it's not giving up whole food, it's giving up no food. So we've got to get real about the market basket of seniors. So I want to just make three points about the myth, the myths. One, the change CPI is not a technical fix. Despite popular notions, op-eds, editorial boards, it is not just a technical and correcting. It would actually fundamentally restructure Social Security. And it could very well have a chain reaction pushing old people into poverty. Under the way the CPI is calculated, if you're now getting 15000 a year when you're 65, when you're 75, you'll have $500 less, and if you live to 85, it'll be reduced by $1,000. I have this in this chart here. The numbers that I'm giving you does not come from Barb Mikulski. It doesn't come from some wonky, lefty think tank. This is coming from the Social Security Actuary. The Social Security Actuary, the keeper of the books and the projections for Social Security. For a single woman with Social Security under the chain CPI, from the time she's 65 to the time she's 80, she could lose as much as $6,000. In other words, the older you get, the worse that it'll get. Remember, under chain CPI, the older you get, the less you will get. The older you get, the worse that it'll get. There's a myth number two, that this is not an immediate cut. Oh, it's going to go into future beneficiaries. Oh, it's a long way off. Well, whoever it hits, it hits hard. Remember that chain reaction. But it's a myth. According to the Social Security Actuary, the chain CPI would affect everyone. And if we pass it as part of the super committee, it will go into effect December 2012. It will go into effect immediately December 2012. Well, that's a pretty big deal. The third myth is this change would mirror people's behavior. But it doesn't take into account health care costs, the cost of prescription drugs, co-pays, and premiums. Remember, one way or the other, we're going to change Medicare. So what I want to do at this time is sound the alert. I want to ring the bell. I'm at my battle station. I'm at my duty station. I want every United States senator when they vote on this, to have informed consent. I want people to read about it and know about it and make up their own minds. I oppose the chain CPI. I oppose Social Security being in the super committee. 
I'm not drawing the line in the sand here today. I want to say for the super committee, God bless them and their work. They're really pursuing this in a duly diligent way. And we hope that we can come to a great resolution where we can reduce our debt, reduce our deficit, and do it in a way that is a balanced approach. But don't balance all this on the backs of senior citizens. You know, FDR signed this bill 75 years ago. Every president, regardless of the poverty uh, of, of party, said we will keep this social contract if you Go by the rules, pay your dues through the payroll tax, Social Security is going to be there for you. Now we want Social Security to be there for the seniors, and we need to be there for the Social Security program. Madam President, I yield the floor, and I hope my colleagues put due diligence into understanding this policy. I yield the floor. I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr.
Ask that it be dispensed with. Without objection. And it's my understanding I have until 11 o'clock. The senator is correct. Thank you. Uh, our country is at a crossroads. If anybody's watching Europe, uh, what they will find is they have been very slow to address the real underlying problems of debt and deficits there. And they have a much more difficult time than what we should because they have a monetary union but without a political union. We have a monetary and a political union. The fact is, is over the next 10 years, we're going to have debt, that, including borrowing money for student loans, including borrowing money to pay back Social Security what has been stolen. We're going to have a true debt of about 27 28 trillion dollars. It's absolutely unsustainable. Matter of fact, it won't happen according to Ben Bernanke because his statement is the world won't loan us the money. Well, what, what is going on in Europe today? What is going on in Europe today is the markets are punishing the countries who have excessive debt to GDP ratios. We said at 100% debt to GDP. And if you see what's happened just in the last few, two weeks to bond rates for Italy, and the differential between an Italian bond rate and a German bond rate is now about 430 basis points. That's 4.3% differential for the same length maturity bond for Italy versus Germany. What's the difference? Germany's living within the confines of their economic capability. Italy didn't. How does that apply to us? It applies to us is that we're not. And what will happen to us if we don't make the difficult changes that are necessary? There's been a lot of rhetoric uh, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, there's been rhetoric from the president in terms of us looking at who pays what in terms of taxes in this country. 
But nobody's looking at what we're doing with our tax code that enables those that are the wealthy in this country to pay less taxes. And so I had my staff put together a list of the subsidies for the wealthy in this country. Because the answer isn't just to raise taxes. Part of the answer is to quit subsidizing these behaviors. So what we did is we came up with a piece that we put out yesterday called, calling on the subsidies for the rich and famous. And it's a report. We looked at every government program. We looked at everything we do. And what we found out is every year, to people having adjusted gross incomes above a million dollars, we give $28 billion worth of benefit in the tax code or through our program. And I would tell you that if, if we really wanted, uh, I'm one of those that thinks that we ought to reform our tax code, that we ought to lower the rates, that we ought to make it to where it actually increases productivity in this country, creates capital investment. But one of the first steps in doing that is to make sure our tax code and our safety net programs are for those that truly need it, not for those that don't. And so we went through the total tax breaks, 113.7 billion over the last four years, mortgage interest, 27.7 billion in tax breaks to people who are making more than a million dollars a year. Well, that's, a, yeah, that's a lot of dough. Rental expenses, the write-off of rental expenses for those making more. And we're not talking businesses. This is, none of this is business deductions. These are personal deductions for the very wealthy in this country that are making more than a million dollars, adjusted gross income a year. We allowed them to write off $64.3 billion. Gambling losses. We allowed the rich and famous to reduce their taxes by $21 billion because we allow them to gamble, and then if they lose money, then they get to write it off. So we're subsidizing the loss. We're subsidizing their gambling losses. Cancel debt, debt write-offs, debt forgiveness. We've allowed $128 billion in terms of write-offs for the, those people making more than a million dollars adjusted gross income. Business entertainment, and this is not through business though, not run through business, this is personal deductions for business entertainment, $607 billion. Electric vehicle, what are we seeing? Who are the people taking advantage of our messing in the economy and creating an incentive for somebody to buy an electric vehicle? The vast majority of them are the very wealthy who don't need the write-off in the first place. And so what we had is $12.5 million last year alone in tax credits for the very wealthy to take a $75 or $8,500 tax credit for buying an electric car. Child care, nanny care for the very wealthy last year, $18 million. Renewable energy tax credits for the very wealthy, $75.6 million. The whole point for putting this report out is we're schizophrenic with our tax code. We've got it upside down. And when people talk about they want the millionaires to pay more, they're paying plenty. They're, the top 1% pays 38%. The top 20% pays 80% of all the taxes in this country. But if you really want to start getting at this, the way you get at it is start taking away the things that reduce their tax burden that don't make sense, that aren't smart, and that don't help those that need the true safety net in our country. These people aren't dependent on these. They'll do just fine without them. And the whole purpose for most of these programs was to create and sustain a safety net for those that are less fortunate. So when we take $113.7 billion in tax cuts, in tax breaks for the wealthy uh, over four years, what could we do with that other money? Well, you could run a NASA that's twice as big. 
You could not borrow $113 billion because their interest rates on that are significant. Another 4 or $5 billion a year in interest that we wouldn't have to borrow. We wouldn't have to make some defense cuts that are going to have to come. We could maybe put more money into Medicare prevention and disease prevention rather than what we've done. There's all sorts of things we could do. So the point behind the report is, is most Americans don't realize that how we're subsidizing through tax credits the very wealthy in this country. And I, I don't have any real problem with them taking the tax credits. We put it out there. The real question we ought to be asking is, why are we doing all this in the first place? Does the economy itself and a free market not really allocate resources better than what we can do? How many Chevy Volts have been sold this year? 5,000. All right, 5,000 times 7,500 bucks, that's what we paid in tax credits to have the Chevy Volt sold because everybody got a 7,500 tax credit that bought it. If it's a viable product, let people buy it. If it's not a viable product, they won't. And yet, who, who, bought, who were the people that bought most of the Chevy Volts? People making significantly more than the average American. So if we're going to do, if we're going to play in the tax code, what we ought to do is play on a very level field. And if we want to create incentives, then we ought to create incentives that actually will do something for the economy rather than just benefit those that make the most money in the economy. So I would say what this spells is a case for us totally reforming our tax code. Most people don't realize that our, this is the one of the side effects. And it's not to say that there aren't some good side effects, but the fact is is when we're running $1.3 trillion deficits, do we really want to be subsidizing the rich and famous in this country with our programs? And I would tell you no. You know, it, when it comes to Medicare Part B, when Medicare Part B started, 50% of the cost of Medicare Part B was to be borne by the Medicare recipient. We're at 25% now. There was never any thought and remember, nobody ever paid anything for that. In other words, that's all borrowed money to do that. Nobody ever contributed it into a Part B fund. They contributed it into a Part A fund, which, by the way, will be bankrupt in four and a half years. What about those on Part D? Nobody ever paid a penny, and we have $13 trillion in unfunded liability on Part D. Why should the very wealthy get subsidized drugs in this country? Why should they get subsidized Part B? In other words, we ought to ask ourselves a question. Think about Social Security. Why is Canada's Social Security system not in trouble? Because Canada looks at how much income you're making every year, and at certain levels you get half of your Social Security because you obviously don't need it because your income's up there, and at a certain other level you get none of it. Why? Because it's based on a means testing mechanism that says this program is designed to be an underpinning for those that need it. Yet we've gone completely the other way. So my point in making this is we have all this discussion about what we should do. We're wringing our hands. How are we going to get it? The first thing to do is to fix the tax code. And the best way to fix it is to call it three months from now, say it's going away, and have the Finance and Ways Committee, Ways and Means Committee in the House come together with a new tax code that fixes all this stuff. Everybody in Washington says that can't be done. Nobody outside of Washington says it can't be done, but we say it can't be done. It can be done. It needs to be done. If we want a healthy future, we need to reform our tax code to generate greater investment, greater job opportunity. We need to lower the rates, and we need to eliminate things such as these that don't truly help the economy, but help those who are smart enough to figure out how to play the game who are the wealthiest in this country. I'm proud of them. I want them to be more successful, but in this time of difficult times, we need to ask them to contribute more. We need to not have these kind of programs in our tax code that actually subsidize those that need no subsidy. With that, I yield the floor note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.